So if you are, again, using your Bibles, turn to 1 John chapter 4. I don't know if this is a problem only for crazy kids growing up, but um, did you guys have like an enemy when you were growing up? Yes. Yeah. I'm not talking about like another kid rival or things like that. I'm talking about like a, a deep nemesis. <laughs> See, for me growing up, I, I, me and my brother, we were like the kids from Lord of the Flies. If you guys know what that book or movie is, I mean, we, we, we were straight up crazy. We like, it was funny because we did all these things with us being the only kids in our neighborhood, so everyone knew it was us. But uh, we would do ding dong ditching, you know, going around, ding dong, run away. We also played this game called Neighborhood Jump, where we jump into as many backyards as we can until someone gets scared and jumps out. And so whoever can go to as many backyards, you win. So uh, we did that, so every, and this would be like in broad daylight as well, we didn't care. Um, yeah, we, 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 we were throwing rocks at this one person's house, and broad daylight again. And uh, they come out, and we run home, and we're like across the street, so we're not sneaking in any way. And then they start knocking on the door, our mom answers, and we're just like, no, no, we're just seeing how far we can throw them. And we accidentally hit your house like 10 times. But, None of these other people were my enemy. My enemy, actually, was one of my school teachers. Oh. See, I, as a kid, I, I really sucked at English, but I was amazing at math. And this teacher started to notice that how good I was at math, and she would always be pushing me further, further, and further. But one summer, she gave my mom this great idea, which I hated, to send me to this math camp for the whole summer. Oh, no. And at that moment, she became my enemy. <laughs> And every single time I was around her, me and my friends would always be doing stupid things in class. I'd be passing notes about her. And she became my enemy. And it wasn't actually until like later on in life that I realized that she was doing something that I needed to be grateful for. So it wasn't until later on, when I was in high school, I received this award for um, being doing uh, academically well. And out of nowhere, I see my teacher, and this was like back in like second grade. I didn't, I didn't even know her anymore at that point. And she came and she grabbed me by the hand. She's like, I've been tracking you this whole entire time throughout your, throughout your school. I wanted to make sure you're doing good and you're getting the right teachers. Wow. Just, oh my, God. my heart was just cut. This woman I considered my enemy was actually loving me so much throughout my entire life. See, over the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about how to get victory in our lives. We discovered that victory is given to those that are privileged to call, but to be called God's children. We can claim this victory through our faith. We can claim it through persevering, through dreams, and we were even surprised that we can have victory in our lives through our failure. And maybe some of you are encouraged by that last one. Because you're like, hey, I, I'm doing the dreams, I'm doing the faith, I'm doing the perseverance, but I keep failing, so failure better work, or there, there ain't nothing else that's going to work in my life. And sometimes you can feel this way of like, we've been talking about victory, but I still feel like I'm failing. No matter what else I'm doing, it just feels like it's not right. Maybe you even feel like a man at a picnic. See, picnics are men's like worst enemies. <laughs> because no matter how macho you are, when you get into a picnic, there's no cool way of sitting. <laughs> I don't have the flexibility for this, so, so you know, there's, as a man, there's, the picnics are like my worst enemy. And that's the same thing, you guys can maybe feel that about your life, but no matter what I do, it just doesn't work. But even in my story, just thinking about above all, the only guarantee for victory is through love. That love covers everything. That, even if you guys have seen this movie, I know that we can't talk about the rugby anymore, so we have to talk about something else. Really? Talk about it. Uh, <laughs> talk about it. But, but, you know, everybody's been talking about this movie, The Joker. Or Joker. Oh, okay. yeah. But, you know, what does everyone say by the end of it? Is, wow, if there was only love. Yeah. That could have changed everything. So there's certain things in our life that the only difference will be made is through love. So my title for this morning is Victory Through Love. Point number one, it takes one to love. First John chapter 4, we're going to be reading verse 7 through 12. It says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born.
born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that he might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. I really love this scripture because it talks a lot about these profound truth statements about love. It answers a lot of questions about love as well. It answers where, what, and what about love. See, love is one of those things, even if in science, in psychology, um, sociology, no matter what, love is just always this mystery in the universe. That how do you get a coward to do something heroic? Love. How do you get a sane person to do, do something stupid? Love. Right? Love is that one gear in the, in the whole system that just messes up everything. See, when it comes to the scripture, it's awesome because it answers all these questions. Well, where does love come from? It says it comes from God. Why do we love? God loves you. Um, wh wh what is love? God is love. It all says these things like God, uh, love comes from God. God is love. And if you love, you are without excuse. I know there's other scriptures that say, hey, because we see the creation of the world, we know there's a creator. Yeah, we understand that. But because we have love in our heart, we know that there's a God. There's this thing that the creation proves creator, morality proves personality. It's understanding that because we see everything around us, okay, we know something created something. Okay, I understand that. But how do we know this thing wants to interact with us? Well, because we have morality. If he just wanted to create us and let us go and let us be and do however we want, then there's no personality. There's just an energy. And that's kind of how people feel today. But because we have morality, because we treat each other with value, that proves personality in our creator. And everyone, we can see this, that throughout the scriptures, he's talking about love, 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 love. But people like to always talk about this thing about having a relationship with God. And 100%, we, we put that out there. But people don't really understand what it means, because they'll say things like this. I have a relationship with God, and therefore I don't need anybody. I have a relationship with God, so therefore I don't need to read my Bible. Therefore, I have a relationship with God. I don't need to repent in my life. My relationship with God is past all those superficial things. That it's just me and God, nothing else needs to change. Well, that doesn't really sound like a relationship to me. It sounds like a service. Yeah. Sounds like you, you get all the benefits, you get all the best from God, and you don't really have to do anything back. Kind of sounds like you're, you're treating God as like a woman of the night. And you're not even paying. That's what it sounds like. And why do we get to this point? It's because we've forgotten what it takes for this relationship with God to even be possible. Throughout the scripture, it talks about it. It's, just, it, it's that, that we forget that our relationship with God, to be honest, is always going to be an unhealthy relationship with God. You know, we all love those stories about the, the unlikely boy who gets the girl by the end of the movie. And we see how he's kind of like marrying up, right? And he's like, there's no way that, you know, Shrek would ever get the princess. No way is that possible. And sometimes we can look into that and like, well, that's, that's exactly our relationship with God. When we come into a relationship with God, we are marrying up. The Bible says that we are the bride of Christ. It's unhealthy, actually. Why? Because he loves you so much more than you're ever going to love him back. He's going to gift you way more than you're ever going to give him. So there's this unbalance of him loving you and, and you just trying to keep up with that relationship. And we look here and how do we know this? Well, think about it in your life. What's the most loving thing someone has done to you to display their love for you? What's the most loving thing that someone has done to display their love for you? I remember I was thinking this morning, obviously there's bigger things in my life than this. But I kind of had a blank, and I was just thinking, I love when my wife makes me cookies. 
That's like one of the biggest displays of love when she cooks me food and things. Because to be honest, I'm quite hard to love in the food area. I'm very picky. You know, if there's an old bread and new bread, I'm getting the new bread. That's just how I am. But, but when it comes to these different displays of love, what do we say to ourselves? We say it's, it's not about the action. It's about the heart. Right? But what's so crazy is that God's display of love, our most romantic thought, cannot compare to his action. Our most romantic thought of display can't even compare to what God did in his action. How did he show his love? By sacrificing his son for you. And that, dis that beats all other displays. Because we hear this and we hear that, oh gosh, it's so unbalanced, we start doubting. We start hearing that God loves us so much. What do people say? Well, why me then? Why does God love me so much? Well, God did not start loving you when you decided to follow his commands or when you decided to believe in him or decided to repent. He loved you regardless of all those things. He sent his son to die for you while you're still in sin. And for some of us, while we're still in sin, currently in our lives. And once we start to grasp this understanding of that God's love was a one-way love for most of our lives, then we start to understand what love should look like in our lives to other people. So he continues to keep reading here in, in 1 John 4, 19-21. It says, We love because he loved us first. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. Whoever does not love their brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us his command. Anyone who loves God, God must also love their brother and sister. See, once you start to understand the love that you have received, then you start to understand the love that you are called to give. See, this kind of love, when it, the Bible says now we are called to love one another, is a love that's not focused on return. It's a love that does not mind the pain because your heart is just full of love and that's all you're focused on doing. So you read here in John 3, 16, one of the most... Um, uh, uh, um, you know, popular scriptures in the Bible says, For God loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. I know previously, a couple weeks ago, I talked about that the love for God was shown how? By his giving. That he loved so much that he needed in his character to give. So this kind of love is focused on giving rather than receiving. When you love, you are called to give. And that's it. If you are not giving, then we know that you are not loving. See, loving any other way than this is not really a love of God. It's the love of sinners. Right? In Luke 6, verse 32 through uh, 36, it talks about the love that, that most of the world actually has. It says, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Yeah. Even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. If you lend to those whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them. And lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will, have ch you will be children of the Most High. Because He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. You know, it's quite funny. The world's quite funny. Um, they love picking from the Bible in certain areas and then jumping ship to a different area when things change in their life. They love the idea of love each other as you would like to be loved. They love that idea. You hear that anybody say that. Well, I, I'm a good person. All you need to do is just treat other people how you want to be treated. But when something bad goes into their life, they are so easy to turn to eye for an eye. Get them back. You know, doesn't matter. Right? It's so easy to jump to another scripture when things aren't going so easy in your life. You know, even in relationships, it, it's, it's, it's like that. It's like, you know, you're mad at the other person. Why? Because they're mad at you. You don't even know why they're mad at you, but you're mad at them because they're mad at you. Right? That's how it is. You're, you're, you're pushing back. You're not treating them how you would want to be treated. Instead, what most people live is they treat others how they're getting treated. Totally different of the love that God is calling us to have. See, yes, I will agree. It takes two to have a relationship. It takes two to make a friendship. 
It takes two to argue or to fight. But that's not the love that we are called to give. It takes one to love. It takes one to be a friend. To show kindness or, or, or patience. To be there for someone. It only takes one. You can't say, I'm unloving or they're not my friend because of what they're doing. That has nothing to do with it. Your love is your decision. See, it, it took God to love you while you were in open rebellion to his love. That was, that, was, that was one. It took one to love. In his display of love when he sent his son to die for us, that was when we were like, we had nothing to do with it. That we were openly putting him on the cross by our sin. See, our love for each other actually has nothing to do for each other. That God's love came from his character. It had nothing to do with who you are or what you're doing. He just simply loved you. See, the purest form of love actually comes in the obedience of God. John 3, 16, uh, excuse me, John um, 13, verse 34 through 35, this new command says, The new command, I give you love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. The greatest form and the purest form of love comes from simply obeying the scripture. It has nothing to do with the other person. You are simply obeying God and loving somebody else. Because most people, they love on kind of like an accounting method. Or kind of like reward system. Either they're kind of like the frequent flyer points. Hey, you come and, and, and kind of come into my life enough, and then I can trust you, and then if you're close enough, then you kind of get more and more, you know, you're like Cole's rewards card, you know, you give them little points free if, if they come into your life. You're either that, or you're like McDonald's Monopoly. You know, if I catch you on the wrong day, I ain't getting the prize. You know, that, that's how people are in their life. Instead of just what, what it says here is you, you love regardless. You just obey this scripture. And it says, if you do this, what does it say? It says, they will know. Mm -hmm. They won't guess. They won't be thinking. It says, they will know that you are Jesus' disciples. How will they know this? Well, by your love. If, you're, if your goal is to simply get the word of the Lord out there and doing your best, then, then this is your victory. Your goal should not to be make a friend. It should be be a friend. Not to go and build a relationship, it's just go and be loving. Their decision on how they react to your love is their decision. But at least when they walk away, they're like, even though I find it difficult, I know that they're right. They can decide upon that. But our decision is go be a friend and go be loving. See, I don't want you to confuse you. This is not a Christian love, this is a Christ love. Why? Because what I mean by that is a lot of people look into Christian churches and Christian people and say, well, their love isn't that great. Well, you know, that's why I'm not imitating those guys' love. I'm imitating Christ's love. Yeah. Right? Even my love, if you kind of imitated my love, it, it wouldn't be that awesome. It wouldn't be that great. You have to go back to Christ and go, okay, how is he loving? And let's love like that. Yeah. And it says, when you love like this, in 1 Corinthians 13, it says, love never fails. I know there's one of my favorite movies, uh, Patch Adams. If you know what that movie is, it's based off a true story of somebody trying to um, implement like free healthcare in America. And he's talking to doctors and saying, hey, if you treat a sickness, you may win or lose. But if you treat the heart, you will always win no matter the outcome. You always win because you touch the heart. But then you say, well, you're saying the Bible says love never fails, but Sean, Love has failed me many times. I've had love in my heart that's, I've had love that in my life that, that, that didn't show up. Love that's hurt me deeper than, than, than hate in my life. Love that lied to me. Love that took something from me that no one else can replace. Sean, you can't say love doesn't fail. It's, it's failed me many times in my life. He said, this love never fails. Not just any love, but this love never fails. Love that is patient and is kind. Does not envy, does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always loves, 
no, excuse me, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Just because you slap something with the name of love and claim it's love, you can't hope that it will succeed. It doesn't work that way. You can't just claim something's love and say, well, it's never going to fail. If, if it isn't a part of this list, or a part of any of God's character that shows his loving character, it's not love. Redefine love in your life. Sex before marriage, it's not love. Any selfish act, it's not love. Anything that you're doing something for somebody that's not protecting them, it's not love. It will fail in some point in your life. Maybe it's succeeding for you at this moment, but, but, but be warned, it will fail. See, this kind of love is, is not a feeling. It actually comes from a command. See, most people, they, they follow their feelings, but feelings were never supposed to be that way. Feelings were always intended to be a shadow. That you, you do something, you act in a certain way, and your feelings will follow. They will change. And even in this, that we're supposed to be loving to people, and then the, the love kind of comes around. Some people will say, well, hey, in my relationship or in my marriage, this, I, I'm starting to feel like we're falling out of love. What does that have to do with anything? It has nothing to do with anything. You just continue to obey the Bible, and your feelings will follow. Yeah. But then you might say, well, hey, so you're saying that you're only loving me? Not because of who I am, but because of what the Bible says. I want people to love me because they want to love me. Like, uh, yeah, I am only loving you because the Bible told me to love you. And guess what? I'm going to love you more than people that want to love you. Because of what the Bible is calling me to do. Yeah. I'm actually going to love you more than it. And that, that's what people have to understand is this love never fails. Come on, Sean. So you can't look at love, though, as though it's like a slot machine. That, oh, I put in the love, I did it, and it didn't come out, I knew it. It's more of like an investment. That this is the love that doesn't fail. You put it in, and yeah, maybe it looks like it's going up and down and sometimes plummeting. But you just got to trust and keep putting in that love. See, my point number one is just for you guys to understand that love is a one-way road. Relationships are two, but love is a one-way. I want you to look into someone in your life that you've been holding love back from because you felt like they are returning love to you and continue to give them love. Love your way to victory. Don't expect a friendship or relationship, any of these things. It, it might come one day, but that has nothing to do with the commands of God. Your command is simply to go with love. Fine. Point number two, though, and something that we might not, we may already feel with this first challenge, is it takes a lot to love. <laughs> Romans 8, verse 37 through 30. 39. It says, no one only sings, we have been made more than conquerors through him who loves us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, or any other powers, neither heights nor death, or any else, anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is Christ Jesus our Lord. Yo, we read this scripture, and this, this just makes us all feel good. Like, this is awesome. Nothing will ever separate you from God's love for you. Nothing. God's love is unconditional. Yes, his relationship has conditions, but his love for you, no conditions. But then we look into this. Okay, God's love is unconditional, but there are many things that can keep us from loving like God. Right? Have you ever heard this or said this to someone? I love you, but... I, I love you, but I just sat down and you get your own water. You know? <laughs> like, it, it could be like the smallest of things in our life. We say, I love you, but uh, you're going to need to take a shower before I I don't, I don't know what it is in your life, but, but uh, I might hear that. So, no, I'm sure. But, uh, you know, all these things, is, it, it, this scripture might look a lot different if, if it was us writing this, right, for our own love. For I am convinced that both death and life, both angels and demons, both present and future, pretty much anything else, throw an etc. on that bad boy, doesn't matter what it is, can't separate our love if I'm hungry and tired. <laughs> right? All, all, all these different things, like, our love is so, it's so, it's, it, when we give it, it's so, it's so fragile. You know, you burn your toast, you're not loving that. The old blacks lose, okay, you know, but whatever it is, right, you know, who not, who not to talk to. <laughs> but, 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 this love, we, we see here that God's love for us, we have to fight for that love. 
Do we think it's going to be easy? It's not going to be easy. Love is hard. It's difficult to always be loving. Even when it comes to the ministry, me being the minister in the church and everyone else kind of doing their ministry in their way, the ministry is actually not that difficult. You know, uh, we talk to people like it's sales. Um, you oversee people like it's management. And you say speeches every now and then like it's a job that gives speeches. I couldn't think of an idea that gives speeches. Uh, TED Ed, I don't know. Um, but doing the ministry is not that difficult. The only thing that makes the ministry extremely hard is when you love. Because love is the difference between being tired and being exhausted. That's the difference. Every job, people can come home tired. But passion and love makes people come home exhausted. Because when you love something, even though you don't want to do it, you do it because you love. I, can't, I, I know I've said this probably a million times. I don't like going grocery shopping. But I love my wife. And so I'm there in aisle seven looking for the cereal. You know? <laughs> like that, that's what I'm doing. Why? Because, because I love. And it's the same thing is that it's going to take a lot for us to love. Especially if it's a one-way road. Because love is one of those things where it has a gauge that has to be full for it to be love. When two people are loving, they can kind of share that gauge. But when you're the only one, only one loving, you, you still got to feel that you still got to feel that gauge. You can't say, well, I'm the only one, so I'm going to meet you here. No, it doesn't work that way. You still got to be the one that fills that gauge. Or else it's still not love. The love that is required does not change, even though you're the one doing all the love. You know, this sounds unfair and unhealthy. Like, well, why do I got to be the one always doing love? Well, now you might be understanding your relationship with God. Now you might be understanding how much God is just Regardless of what he's getting back, how much he loves you. Because you think you're deserving of God's love? Some people might even come in and say, well, hey, Sean, church, you guys are all nice and everything, but I'm a good person. Yeah, I, I don't really need these things. This is just to help me along. I, I, you know, me and God, we're good. Uh, church, I can come every now and then, whenever, the Bible. Yeah, I, I read that sometimes. I, I'm not really here for that. Well, you, I want you to understand, don't kid yourself. You're not easy to love. None of us are. Right? It's one of those things where have you ever felt that? Like, I love you. But sometimes I just feel like kicking you out of the plane. <laughs> like, like we, with the most loving people in our lives, we can feel that way. You know, for me, like I said, I'm not, I'm not an easy person to love, especially with my eating habits. You know, if I buy a banana and I don't eat it that day, I'm not eating it. <laughs> like I'm telling you, like, uh, like I don't like I don't like leftovers. I don't like all these things. And my wife, she like moves the world around me just to make sure I'm not like, you know, uh, malnourished in my life. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I'm not easy to love in that way. And that's all of us. We're kind of like how God treats us. It's kind of like if you guys ever had a dog, the dog does stupid things. You want to kind of like kick the dog, yeah. but you don't because you love the dog. Yeah. And you're like, Sean, are you saying that we're dogs? Yes, but you're cute dogs. <laughs> we're all cute dogs, all right? But that's kind of us. We're, we're all difficult to love, but God still loves us. In 1 John 5, 3-4, uh, it says, In fact, this is love for God to keep His commands, and His commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. See, wouldn't you just simply love even the dog, even my food things, all these random things? Love is not burdensome. It might be difficult in some ways, but it's not burdensome to love you. Yeah, we might have our challenges. God still calls us to repent in our lives. He's like, it's not a burden for me to love. See, once you get to that point, it's not, it's not a challenge to keep loving those that you've been studying the Bible with and they don't want to just turn their phone calls. To love those that, that have hurt you in your life. It's not a burden to keep giving that life. It's, you just simply love. See, why do we love each other? Well, because God commands it. And we, we are called to love each other. And, um, you know, way more than, than what the world shows love to be. And people will actually start freaking, freaking out about this. And they'll start questioning you. Love, Why do you love me so much? What do you want from me? Well, you need to love people to the point where it almost makes them feel a little bit uncomfortable. What, what do you want from me? What's going on? You need to love somebody more than they love themselves. You need to love them more than they want you to love them. 
This might actually be a test. You know, they might actually test your love for you, uh, them for you. You know, I love one of um, Martin Luther King's, one of his, his, his favorite, uh, one of my favorite quotes from him is when he was talking about how there's persecution going on in America against the civil rights. And one thing he said, he says, we shall match your capability to inflict suffering by our incapability, or excuse me, by our capability to endure suffering. We shall match your capability to inflict suffering by our capability to endure suffering. Now, I don't want to make that comparison that our love for each other is like you know, fighting for the civil rights. Um, but we can't feel that way at least sometimes. And that's the thing that we have to match it with them. Is that people's fight to not to get receive love in their life needs to be matched by our endurance to still be there. We need to match it. You'll say, well, hey, I'm doing all these loving things, yet they keep turning their back. You gotta match it. You gotta match it with your endurance to keep showing love. See, I have somebody in my life who I really grown to trust and really love. And um, you know, I think about why do I love and trust Joe Willis so much? My mentor, he's the church leader back in Sydney. It's because I realized he sometimes loves me more than I love myself. Yeah. Even T, my wife. I literally probably wouldn't have a visa. Uh, there, there's been a lot of bad things happening in my life. If, if I didn't have people around me that loved me more than I loved myself. That's how you have to get people feeling around you. It's because why? It's because throughout the ministry, though love is difficult, I, I felt in the ministry you have kind of two different types of tears. When someone decides to walk away from God. One is where you gave it your all. And you know there's nothing more that you can do for them. And, it's just, and then you just break down before God. I, I, I don't know what else I can do. The other is when you feel like you didn't do enough. That one seems a little bit. We start doubting and thinking, man, I, I could have gave him a little bit more love. I you know, there's a famous quote that says, the pain of falling short is much bearable than stopping short. My last challenge to you is love your way to death. Give it all you have and a little bit more. You keep giving love until there's nothing else to do, because that is the only guarantee in life, guys. So you're talking about in the last previous weeks, faith, dream, all these things. I still want to give you hope that these things can still lead to victory. But one of the only guarantees in life is that love never fails. Redefine your love. Continue to give it, even if you're the only one giving it. And let's all reach victory.